Now I'll try to get technology to work here. See if this is going to work. Are you seeing my screen? So, welcome. I am Ken Estes. I am the Ag Program Lead at CC Livingston and the owner of Joe Glenn Farms, a Lippitt Morgan sport horse breeding farm in Caledonia, New York. My family has been in farming um, in Caledonia since the 1832, and I'm six, the sixth generation to do so on that same piece of ground. Um, I came to this role at CCE after 25 years of owning a design build landscape business with a degree in landscape architecture from Cornell, as well as an associate's degree in natural resources and environmental conservation from Morrisville. My approach to pasture management is not unlike managing turf. Tonight, we will touch um, on some of the basic best management practices I've used in managing my own practice, my own pastures at Joe Glenn Farm. Tonight we'll begin with soil health and some of the practices that will be most cost effective to your management strategies. Then we will go through some terms and how they apply to the overall <laughs> management decisions. We will touch on grazing systems and options. We will look at weed control and the benefits of mowing and we'll finish up on overseeding and establishing new pastures. If at any time you have any questions, please, uh, like Abby said, drop them in the chat or raise your hand and I will try to answer them as we go along. So let's get started. So it's, it seems like a given, but first we must ask the question, do I have a horse pasture? Um, a, pasture, a pasture much supply growing forage, small pastures may at best be a turnout and large acres may be at best a range. Pastures usually are thought of as land that must be managed if it is to supply growing forage. So why pasture management or why manage our pastures? Pastures are profitable. They protect surface and groundwater from nutrient pollution. They reduce soil erosion. They improve forage yield and quality. They reduce weeds and improve aesthetics. You can harvest high or low quality forage from any pasture depending on a harvest management practice. So where do we begin? I always um, start with a soil test. Why a soil test? It is the only way for us to check our current soil fertility. This is the only as good as the quality of the sample taken. I'll go into what I mean shortly. Um, it is recommended that we test our soil every three years. Testing is available through many commercial organizations as well as most CCE county offices or through specific labs um, like we use Dairy One. Um, it all comes down to the fact that plants struggle to grow without access to nutrients and the, mean to utilize, the means to utilize them. So soil testing, it's, it's not hard to take a soil test or soil sample um, with the proper tools and something um, you can do yourself or have a done by a professional um, or you can have help from a Cornell Cooperative Extension agent. Um, simply you define the area that you're going to sample. For lack of a better description, I employ the zigzag pattern um, while we walk around the area that we're taking and take um, 10 to 20 samples. We'll avoid any irregularities in the pasture that may be untypical um, of the overall characteristics of the pasture. Large pastures, I may sample individually or based on the soil type of that pasture. And I'll get into that a little bit with the example that I'll share shortly. 
While small pastures, I may combine into one. Um, like I mentioned, soil type may be a determining factor in the sample area. So let's take a look in a few more details um, and we'll go through the process that we go through in taking a soil test. So with me, it begins with the soil survey and you can access this is this is an online database that you can go on and look at your property. You can put in the description or this actually is my farm and the um, pasture that we're going to focus on this evening. So the first photo is using that. Um, it's a sample corresponding the soil map. Um, you'll see it can encompass a large area or a small area. Um, we'll go on to the second photo, which kind of blows up the pastures. Um, so I'm going to focus in on the PG, which is the one of the pastures that I did a soil test for that we'll look at the, the soil type report. So this is generally what a soil report looks like, um, can be overwhelming, can be um, hard to understand. So we'll get into um, the information that's provided um, with that. So if you do multiple sites on your property, you'll end up getting multiple reports on the amount of property that you do. So when we look at the, the map here, so this is the area that we're going to, that I'm focusing on, which is this PG soil or Palmyra gravel. If we were looking at one of my other pastures, that may have a combination of soils and I might do a test for this smaller area or this bigger area and do them separately in order to get an accurate representation of the soil um, for those locations. So let's look at uh, the report in a little more detail. Now what? What does it all mean? Um, while the form has graphs, numbers, recommendations, and guidelines, we'll take a moment and look at the results of my pasture. So we'll first look at the, the phosphorus, the potassium, the calcium, and the magnesium, which on this test are high or very high, um, which is likely an indication that we put manure on the, the pasture prior to the soil test being taken or and pre-application. So moving on, we'll look at the next key component, which is pH. And our value for pH is 7.3. This is a indicator of um, whether or not our, our nutrients are going to be ready available. And we want our pastures to be um, within the 6 to 8 to 7, 3 range in order to add optim optimal growth. So if this number was more acidic, um, and say it was in the five, six to six, four range, the recommendation would give us a lime recommendation. In this case, because we're alkaline, we are at 7.3, where seven is neutral, um, it's not, it's saying that lime isn't needed in that. So next we will look at nitrogen and nitrogen values over the next three years. Um, it's, as you can see, there's a lower nitrogen requirement at seeding, which would be year one. And then as the crop develops, the, 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 the numbers increase. And you'll see that, that it is in pounds per acre. So this is a number that depending on the size of the proper, the, the pasture, it may have to get converted. And one of those, um, ways to do that is through a conversion to convert that to, um, to pounds per thousand square feet. And you would do that, I can get to the formula so I can read it off to you. The conversion is one pound per acre equals 0 0.02296 pounds per thousand square feet. Or you can just divide the number like the 20 or 40 by the by 43.56, which is 43,560 is an acre. We get the, is where that come from. 
You also note in this that there are some final notes at the bottom that are usually key indicators to how you might be able to best um, perpetuate the, the results of the test. And in this case, it says that because of the pH that we don't need to apply lime. Now, had it said that we needed to apply lime, it would have recommended that lime be applied at least six months prior to the crop development. And that usually is the case because lime takes about that long to actually have a direct bearing on um, the soil pH there. But it doesn't mean that you can't apply um, lime at other times of the year. It usually just takes six months for it to actively change the soil characteristics temporarily. But. So when it comes to applying fertilizer or lime, basically there are two options, a broadcast spreader or a drop spreader. Each have their pros and cons and will either in either case need to be calibrated to the specific fertilizer and application rates. In both cases, it requires an operator that can manage the spread and ensure that there is no excess overlap or voids as this will show up in, crop, in the crop with potential for fertilizer burn if the fertilizer is in excess and it will have little to no benefit if areas are missed. This can generally be seen with green stripes. A pro tip is spread at half rate and go over the pasture twice in a checker pattern in opposite directions. This will benefit by putting less on at one time, but make the overlap um, in a crossing pattern. So you're, you're not going to miss any places. So pro tip. So another management tool in the toolbox is harrowing or dragging to disperse manure. This aids in breaking down the manure so that the plants can access it. And it also plays a, cle a clear role in parasite management. Ideally, it is best done when it is hot and dry, and it is best to do this multiple times a year, two to three times um, is the recommendation. Um, equipment can be something you purchase or something that is repurposed. I've seen chain link fences used, tires fastened together, an old box spring um, used. Personally, I use an old weeder. Uh, that was for commercial agriculture with a commercial spike tooth harrow behind it to manage mine. So there are many options with that. Aeration is the next tool in my toolbox as aeration is our best defense against compaction and provides a void for water, air, and nutrients, all key components to a healthy soil. Um, and this also, is this provides us with an opportunity to increase, decrease the potential for, excuse me, decrease the potential for compaction. Um, if this was in person, I would be showing you a rainfall simulator. And this would show that water running on a pasture that's compacted will run off the surface and erode the surface rather than enter into the, the soil. If you're interested in that, um, you can go on to YouTube and just Google rainfall simulator for pasture management and it will um, show you that. Um, here we have two examples of two different types of aeration, both equally effective but slightly different pros and cons. While core aeration takes a physical core and removes the core and puts it on the surface, while the second is a uh, spike aerator um, that puts a hole in the ground other than pulling out a core. Um, or you can look at the spike aerator in this photograph, which is an aerator, which actually is a, uh, has a, a vibrating motion that penetrates and fractures the soil and goes down and puts a hole below the soil um, that's larger than at the surface. Uh, this is ideal for turf management and works very well in pasture management. I use both core aeration and spike aeration um, for the management of my pastures, and I do it in succession. Um, the, 
when I'm applying fertilizer or I'm overseeding, I will use the aerator um, versus the core aerator. And we'll talk about overseeding and fertilization um, a little bit later as well. Many of us ask ourselves the question this time of year, is my pasture ready for grazing? Seems like a simple one, but one not to overlook when looking at best management practice, but have you checked your fence? This is the time to make any repairs or upgrades, usually is taking place in the spring as, it, as needed. Once we know our enclosure is ready, the next thing we want to do is evaluate forage, how, far, how tall our forage is. It is best not to begin grazing before it reaches a height of six to eight inches. And over an often overlooked condition is our pasture too wet. We don't want to start grazing or continually grazing on a pasture that is wet that may cause harm to it, like punching the soil up or increasing the likelihood for compaction, as we talked about with aeration um, just in the slide prior. So we have now met the, all the conditions and requirements to start grazing. And this is my recommendation to introduce our horses to a spring pasture. It begins with letting them graze for 15 minutes and then remove. And we can repeat this um, by adding and increasing 15 minutes each day until you reach a five hours before letting them graze unrestricted. Stop grading when the average height again is at three to four inches and either put them on a new pasture or allow the pasture to rest until it reaches the six to eight inches again. If we look at the most com common problem I find in evaluating pastures, it has to do with stocking rates which is the number of animals per unit of land and the stocking density, which refers to the animal on a specific area of pasture or grazed land within a farm at one moment in time. Another term that you may run across is animal units or AU, which equals 1000 pounds of animal weight or the average horse size, unlike ponies or drafts that require a conversion. As we look at more terms, carrying capacity or how many horses a, per acre are appropriate, the term overstock stocking, which is a practice of pasturing more animals than a land can sustain without damaging the grass beyond recovery. And understocking, which is having too few of animals on a pasture to keep up with the amount of forage produced. When we look at the best management practice, one horse will require two to four acres of pasture for continual or rotational grazing. It's worth repeating. One horse requires two to four acres of pasture. Can one horse live on less than two acres? Yes, but it will require supplemental forage and the likely of a likelihood of a grazing system that utilizes dry locks or a track pasture. Basically, there are three types of grazing system, continuous, rotational, and controlled. Rotational has soil health benefits mentioned earlier, and ideally this should be something that we all are striving for over continuous grazing. Unless you are so understocked that you have to mow along with grazing to control growth. Rotational grazing, rotating a herd of horses through smaller enclosed pastures when forage growth and weather are optimal. Grazing to a height of an average of three to four inches like I've mentioned before prior and allow the pasture to rest. While control grazing is just that, it involves a restriction of grazing to a controlled time period or with a muzzle while the herd is either on dry lot or a track pasture.
Whether you currently are utilizing continuous grazing or rotational grazing, the need for a dry lot or a stress lot, as some may call them, is desirable. A dry lot is an enclosure that is adjacent to or part of a grazing system that is used to house horses when grazing conditions are not optimal, as well as with horse herds that require a restricted diet. I will try not to go down a rabbit hole, but track pastures is something I can spend a lot of time on. But in short, they are the same as above, but in addition provide and supplement ex exercise and enrichment are often included in with a track pasture. So we'll take a look at our dry lots and basic drawing showing the overview of the concept of rotational grazing system. In my system shown here, I'll stick them over. So I have four dry lots. Dry lot one, dry lot two, dry lot three, and dry lot four, which all have access to different and varying pastures as needed um, within that. So when you look at the basic diagram of a um, rotational system with a dry lot, we have a number of pastures from two to five or more um, that allow us to rotate, graze three to four inches, take them off, put them onto pasture two, and go through the cycle as we go around um, and end up having a rest period that allows us to come back to the beginning and start the, the process over again. So when you rotate to a track pasture system, it adds one more element and we'll take a look at, at my track pasture, which encompasses the fourth dry lot. Um, it is about a half mile long, um, encompasses the wood lot with a, a path, and it comes up on a ridge and goes along the pasture. So I have access points to the new pasture throughout the track pasture. This spur actually allows us to access, access this pasture, but actually is in development of my second um, track pasture, which will encompass this dry lot and have a track pasture around our, our performance area. So when we look at the, the layout on, on the schematic, is essentially the same thing as we saw earlier, other than there is a path around the outside perimeter and allows for some different size and scale um, rest areas, whether that be for um, hay, hay delivery, or enrichment, the size of the stress lot or the, um, the dry lot can be adjusted and potentially be the same size as on the, this side over here and to allow for another pasture for us to rotate in succession the same way um, or through a restricted diet if our animals are requiring that. They will, In the explanation of a track pasture, it provides exercise, activity, and movement of the horse, much like they would get in a, um, a range site setting. Um, I have seen great benefit to the utilization of them for horses that are um, overweight. They tend to manage their hooves um, much better and their management of weight is um, much better than um, strictly on dry light or on a controlled or rotational gra grazing system. Um, they are, in my opinion, the wave of the future, especially with smaller um, lots. Um, it is a trend that has taken um, wildfire in Europe and it is starting to take hold in the States as well. Switching gears, weeds, um, the one thing that can make for a big problem in our pastures um, can be avoided potentially with some approaches. Um, some weeds are very invasive and without control soon will shut out native grasses or grasses that we are desirable to our, our equine, like these thistle that are shown in the picture here. 
So let's talk about weed control. Our first approach is mechanical hand removal. Labor intensive, I know, but what isn't when it comes to our care of our precious horses? This is a best practice when the weeds are few and can be managed by hand removal. The next method it, through cultural practices like mowing, which is the best be com completed when the weeds are actively growing at a, and at a cost before the seed and at all costs before the, the weeds go to seed. Um, if we wait till they go to seed, we are actually causing more problems than if we would have done it earlier. Grazing like mowing can help with weed management as well, but also can be part of the contributing factor to why we have weeds. When we overgraze our pastures and overstock them, it causes our grass to decline and create voids in the stands. And this allows for weeds to take advantage um, and fill those voids. The third is soil health and fertility. As I mentioned earlier, um, healthy soil gives us our grass the most opportunity to be highly competitive against weed growth and for weeds taking root. Um, a healthy forage is going to have less of a disadvantage from weeds. Another option I employ when the weeds get the best of me is I use a propane torch, torch to destroy the weed, primarily the weed seed, this typically I use for thistle and burdock when it has gone to seed as an alternative to hand removal. I will say that it does a good job with seeds, but it doesn't necessarily kill the plant. The plant is still likely to come back uh, next season. The last option is chemical control. One that I, I don't often use um, but it definitely begins with reading of the label. The label has to be listed um, for use in pastures and the weed that we are trying to control needs to be on the label as well. When it comes to chemical management, I always seek out a professional when it comes to chemical control as they have the legal um, classification in order to apply them versus myself. When it comes to rest after an application, I typically double the recommendation that the label lists as a precaution. Weeds can be a problem and they typically are when we overgraze and don't use our best management practices. Hey, Ken, we yep. have a... We have a question about mowing in the chat. Okay. Would you, um, so I can read it. So Terry asked, is the optimum height to mow pasture vary with types of grass? He was advised by the ag agent to keep bahia fields about four inches tall. I will get right into that as we are next topic up is on mowing and I'll go over the details of that in, as we go on through the next slides. So as I mentioned, mowing helps control weeds, but when should I mow? As we know, horses are inconsistent grazers, as we can see from the image, often choose the short, immature grasses over large, more mature grasses. Mowing is a tool when pastures are understocked and through management after a pasture has been grazed to between three and four inches. Why timing? timely mowing matters as a management tool. As we have learned, horses are inconsistent grazers and avoid more mature grass. Mowing helps come, overcome mature grasses and keeps the plant at a more palatable and the nutrients at a higher level as well. As we also learn, mowing can help with weed control and keep those plants from going to seed. When our pastures grow at a rate that exceeds our stocking ability, we can use the harvest of the excess forage in production of hay. This can be stockpiled and used for sub sub substitute forage when pastures are unavailable. Utilizing the hay is a good way to fully utilize the forage resource in your pastures, allowing for that 
in our management plan. Oops. If there is one thing that I bring to the toolbox from managing turf is mowers and sharp blades matter. Here you will see three types of mowers, the flail mower, the brush hog, and the zero turn, which also can be called a finish mower. If the picture says anything, anything one is for the management of turf and the others are for controlling tall grass. In a management system of pastures, I prefer to manage my pastures with a zero turn or a tractor with a finish mower over the use of my brush hog. A flail mower might be a second option to a zero turn and a better option than a brush hog. Why you ask? Sharp blades make clean cuts. Making clean cuts will keep the grass in a healthiest form. Plus, if we are going to invest in equipment, why not invest in something that's going to be utilized in other applications? Um, and turf mowers mow exceptionally well at three to four inches. Remember those blades require sharpening and should be sharpened every eight to 12, 12 hours of use. Getting to the question earlier, when to mow? This graph helps us understand that different grasses have different grazing heights as well as also have different mowing heights. Whether it be turf grass or your pasture grass, one rule that applies to mowing is take half, leave half. So when we look at these different varieties of grass, whether it be Timothy broom grass or orchard grass, we like to um, optimize or stop grazing at four inches as well as mowing would be at that four inch height as well to even out the pasture. When we look at Kentucky bluegrass or crested wheatgrass, we can, they can be grazed at a little lower rate and can be mowed at a lower rate. Grazing um, here is at three inches. So Kentucky bluegrass can be mowed to three inches. In a mixed stand, typically I am mowing between four and five inches on the mower. Um, for the management of my pastures. Does that answer your question? Before I move on. I hope that answers your question. So now we'll move on to the next thing. When should we overseed or when to reestablish our pasture? It is my recommendation to choose to reestablish your pasture when the forage is less than 40% of the overall stand. This may seem silly, but I use a hula hoop as a tool to evaluate stand density. Much like the process of for soil testing, it starts at the edge of the pasture and I throw the hula hoop out into the pasture um, and where it lands, I then evaluate inside the hula hoop um, take the inventory of the stand density, the forage species, the amount of bare soil. Once I'm done, I take and throw it again. I move in a zigzag, zigzag pattern across the pasture and around the pasture, evaluating and taking notes of each of these. Once I've reached the conclusion, I will then average the, the results to determine if we have less than 40% viability or the grazing forage that's in that area is something that the horses will, will utilize. Um, if it's less than 40%, I always err towards reestablishment versus. So versus overseeding. So overseeding, um, we look at when the stand is more than 40%, but we're still finding that the pasture is in need of some new vigor or it is a good time, it is a good time to consider overseeding. This is your opportunity to improve the grass species in legumes. As we'll see in a little later slide, um, the lifespan of seed, especially if we're managing it in the process of keeping it in that vegetative state and not letting it go to seed, we are not allowing for any seed drop 
repopulating um, in the management practice. So overseeding is definitely a tool that will come into play with that management process. So now that we made the decision to either reestablish or overseed, which seed should we use? In our region, we focus on cool season grasses and legumes. We'll see in this slide here that there's the, the most common grasses that you'll find in New York um, and the Northeast for that matter. Um, we have tall fescue and a fight free only for horses. Um, Timothy, orchard grass, Kentucky blue, perennial ryegrass, and smooth broom. For the legumes, um, we have alfalfa, we have bird's foot trefoil, we have gladlone clover, white clover, and red clover. Um, I won't get into the descriptions of these, but if you want to take a, um, as we're recording this, you can come back to it, or you can take a photograph of the slide. It shows the advantages and disadvantages of each of these um, these species of grass or legumes. Um, as you can see, some of them um, does not persist with close grazing as it's listed in the broom grass. Um, so that is another indication that the plant will need to be overseeded over time or over the length of a, uh, a pasture. And typically I will look at a five-year rotation on overseeding um, my pasture that's in continuous pasture and not going through a rotation into another crop. So what grass mixes should I do? And I always recommend we look at a mixture of seed rather than a specific seed, unless we're doing a frost seeding um, where we're trying to introduce legumes um, into that. So here are a couple examples of mixtures that are pre-prepared. Um, this pro horse um, and Kentucky horse pasture mix are commercially prepared. So they're ones that are going to be consistent um, across year to year. Um, I have used both of these to much success on my pastures. Um, if you've been paying attention to the slide photos as we've gone along and will continue to go along, you will see photos of the reestablishment of one of my pastures and the end result was using the Kentucky horse blend. And you'll see within the Kentucky horse blend, it has perennial ryegrass, it has a broom grass um, in greatest percentage. It has some forage Kentucky bluegrass, which is different than the bluegrass that you would find in your lawn. Uh, it has Timothy, and it has orchard grasses and it has a jumbo clover. Um, and you can read the explanations of why they use the, the jumbo clover because it's um, frequently recommended with horse pastures. The pro horse is a little different. It is more populated in orchard grass and perennial rye. It has a little bit of Timothy and less Kentucky bluegrass. And it has facilium in it as well, which is a fescue rye hybrid. So it is a combination of that and it is endophyte free that I've used to um, much success. Much like applying fertilizer, um, the same equipment you use um, will be used in the applying of seed. With seed, it is all about soil to seed contact and a no-till drill or this drop setter seeder with an aerator tend to do the best job in overseeding. And the broadcast spreader can be used to frost seed, as I've mentioned, and as well in a pasture tilled and as a prepared seed bed, um, like I had in the reestablishment of my pastures in the slide photos earlier, um, that is in both of them I utilize in my management. When we overseed, we first mow the pasture and typically we'll mow the pasture closer than the recommended height that I've mentioned earlier. So usually I'll mow to between two and three inches. 
um, that will give us the greatest opportunity for that soil to seed contact and not have a, the um, existing forage keep the seed from getting to the to the soil. Once this regrows, it'll actually provide shade and um, to the seed for its germination process. But in second stage, I will scarify. So I mow, I scarify with the harrow um, that I mentioned earlier with tines down to break up the soil. I will then seed with the broadcast spreader. I will scarify again to ensure that we are getting good seed to soil contact. And then I will roll. This is the only time that I recommend rolling a forage or a pasture. Um, you'll see it done in hay fields, but this is a, a process that does add compaction and not one that's ideal for the growing structure of the forage. So when we look at the difference of overseeding with a no-till drill, we can see, we can eliminate the scarification process and the, the, the need for going over the pasture more times with the scarification. Um, this allows for the, the no-till or the aerovator allow for better soil to seed contact um, and as well. So, Otherwise, you know, utilizing the no-till or the aerator seeder, you can just seed it. So there's it ensures the best seed to soil contact. Um, no-till is your best option if you are looking for soil to seed contact. Um, the aerator is the second option. Otherwise, we'll go back to the scarification process. So New seeding or an overseeding needs a significant rest period to get established before grazing. This may be the biggest barrier to this process in the management of our pastures. Once our seed germinates, which varies by species, can take up to 35 days, we then allow it to grow six inches, then mow it back to four inches. We repeat this three times before we allow or introduce grazing once again. This can take as long as six months before grazing can take place, can take as long as six months. So when is the best time to, sick the, to, to seed? Well, based on the prior slide, it was six months ago <laughs> because we don't have time to necessarily wait for our pastures to be ready for us to utilize them. But realistically, it is best to seed spring, March 15th to May 15th. Typically those seedings in March are frost seedings of legumes. Frost seedings um, with legumes tend to work better than trying to seed um, your orchard grass, primarily because legumes tend to be a small seed and the frost or the snow will actually take the seed down into and make a good soil to seed contact um, with that. The bigger seed tends to stay up in the grass um, with that and doesn't have as good of stand development um, in those frost seeding scenarios. Uh, so the second best time, or actually in my opinion, the best time to seed is August 1st through September 15th, primarily because this gives us our best opportunity for rest, for the rest period, and sets you up for the potential for spring grazing. I will mention that if in the fall, we're only able to mow one or two times, it is still my recommendation not to put your, your animals directly onto that spring pasture if it hasn't gone through those three cycles. I still recommend going through one mowing cycle or two if needed um, before I put the horses on it. Um, we want to allow that forage growth top and root zone to get developed before we introduce hooves to the, the scenario. Um, and hooves can 
damage new forage um, in the growing process. So I still recommend that three cycles, that three mowing cycles um, prior to grazing. So kind of in conclusion, we'll kind of go over the, the things that I utilize, the seven steps to managing your pastures. Um, the first is fertilization. Fertilization based on your soil tests is the best way to keep your pastures growing optimally and allows your pastures to be most competitive against weed development and get you the most bang for your buck. Yes, fertilizer is expensive, especially now, but it will have a payout in return in your management process. Second is harrowing, dragging manure. It is going to have a benefit in parasite management. It also is going to allow that manure to be utilized by the plant in the uptake of its nutrients by breaking it down rather than leaving it in pile and having it um, kill the grass that it's um, around. Third one, is aeration. As I mentioned, aeration allows the, the entry of air, water, and nutrients into the soil. It uh, alleviates compaction uh, as well. Fourth is controlling weeds. And I mentioned all the processes that we can go through from manual to um, mechanical means of controlling our weeds. And the best one I mentioned as the one Number one is fertilization and keeping our grass stands healthy so that they are able to adequately compete against the, the weed population. Number five is mowing and utilizing a mower with sharp blades um, to manage our pastures and to keep the grass blade as healthy as possible, but also keeping it in a, in a vegetative state that is most palatable to our, our equine. Six is utilizing overseeding. Overseeding as a way to introduce new seed to a stand that is becoming tired, as well as a way to increase our potential for quality forage by introducing new and more viable seed um, with that. As I mentioned, that seed does have a shelf life on the forage. So forage does have a shelf life and will decline over time, regardless of our management practice, because we are eliminating the seed stage of it, which is the less, the least nutritious for the animal. Seven, rest. If there's one thing that I can emphasize, I can't emphasize more, is our pastures need to rest. They need to be allowed to grow back before we continually graze them. That's why rotational grazing or a controlled grazing system allows for that forage to have the best advantage to keep in that growing state and provide a resource for our equine. So if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them now. If there are any um, that I can't get to, I'll share my contact information as um, you can reach out to me directly. So Nancy, you can unmute yourself and... Um, okay, yeah. can you hear me? I can. Okay, Hi. great. Um, thank you for taking um, my question. I have a question. We have, <laughs> our pastures are not, in great condition. This was super helpful, but we have a buttercup and pigweed. Both seem to be big issues in our pastures and our buttercup has already flowered. So do you recommend just going and mowing that down? Yeah, you're going to, eat. mowing it down before it goes to seed is going to be beneficial. The sooner the better is going to help as buttercup can be um, a problem to your horse if they ingest it. Um, typically horses will avoid it, um, mm -hmm. though it isn't as uh, big of a problem as it could be. Um, but that's the other option is that you do result to chemical management for, for buttercup. It's a tough plant to control by any means, 
um, if it's um, there. And it is, in most cases, an indication when I find it, reestablishment is your best route. Yeah. Um, Reestablish the pastures. Reestablishing the pasture. Because you, yeah. you're, and in that case, you're going to also go through the, the removal of any of the existing um, problem plants. Now, it's possible that this, the seed pool in the soil is going to be there to repopulate. But if we introduce new seed to it and give it all the mechanisms that it needs in order to grow um, well, that'll give us our best opportunity to prevent the weed from coming back again. So would you recommend waiting to do that until this fall? Um, yes and no. Um, we are still in a window to do that now. Um, in any case, you're looking at a rest period to you're going to lose the pasture. So it's if you're trying to get any utilization out of it, waiting till fall, is going to be an optimal time for seeding. It may not be the optimal time to kill the plant. Um, right. And it's killing the plant during its, when it's actively growing, if you're using chemical management is your only opportunity to kill the plant. Yeah. Um, sort of um, actually tilling it up and cultivating the area um, to alleviate the, the weed problem. Right, we wanted to avoid chemical, but yeah. I almost think we don't have a choice. And unfortunately, that in some cases is the is the result. Um, unfortunately. Okay. Would you, you know, so like you said, you just have to look at, you know, what's in the chemical and make sure that this weed is listed for treatment. Um, or, you know, should we try, we've read some things about, you know, non-chemical treatments. It actually kills it, but it doesn't get down to the root. Right. So I don't think that's gonna help. Right. Yeah, in any case with any um, chemical, you're looking at the, the chemical has to be labeled for pastures or for forage. And it has to, um, indicate that the species that you're trying to control has to be listed on the label as well as a general rule of thumb. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And we do have a couple questions in the chat. Okay. Um, so the first one is, um, how well will this work with a clay or hard pan situation? So with a clay or hard pan situation, we may end up, and I didn't talk much about it because I don't necessarily utilize it often because of the parasite implication, but aeration and top dressing with manure will improve that scenario. So um, typically when I am overseeding clay soil, you may use the, the, the same scenario that I mentioned with the fertilization, you may want to go over it multiple times in order to get the scarification with a no-till drill system or with an aerator. Um, scare the process of utilizing a broadcast spreader, I would not recommend for clay soil because you're just not going to get good soil to seed contact. And our next question in the chat, is there benefit to allowing the field to go to seed every two to three years to assist with reseeding? It, it can be. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have the, the ability to let it do that, um, you're going to lose the, the, the vegetative use utilization of it. The only, the only downside to that is your potentially not getting as strong a seed um, from that seed development as you may have from a, a, a commercially prepared seed. That answers your question. In most cases, people don't have the opportunity, the option to do that. They don't have the, the space to allow it to, to be left alone or set aside. Um, our next question, 
Um, what is the best way to kill a pasture to make a dry lot uh, for Morgan horses? Best way to um, kill a dry lot is um, done in a couple ways. I've done it um, with just the stripping of the sod and um, removing the sod with either a sod cutter or a bucket and then incorporating sand and treating it like an arena and consistently, you know, working that area up until the grass is all gone. I have employed um, a plastic mulching scenario where you actually put a dense tarp or blast back plastic over it in order to kill the grass. That takes some, some time. It's when we starve it um, from the sunlight, it can't do this photosynthesis process and eventually it does kill the, um, the grass off. I use that as a method to um, in the garden um, quite frequently as well. So it's a good option. You know, you can always go chemical route as well um, or scarification, just continual scarification um, works well. I've even had one instance where I um, just added sand to the, the surface and work the sand in and eventually the sand does dry the turf out. Um, or you can utilize a tool of overstocking it um, with horses that are able to eat the grass and kill it off that way, um, potentially. With my track pasture with our Morgans, um, that was the, the method that I employed was I ended up um, letting them um, graze. There wasn't a lot of forage, so I wasn't um, worrying about too much energy and too much sugars with that, with this, um, with a control, their controlled system. But it allowed them to, I, they didn't have pasture access, they just had track pasture access. And that ended up getting a control of the pasture. So I no longer have a viable um, forage um, in the track pasture. I do have it on the perimeter um, as they feed under the fence to the existing pasture. Uh, but that's what I utilized. Hope that answers your question. Do we have any other questions for Ken? Okay, if you think of a question later, um, Ken shared his contact info right here on the screen. Um, and so thank you very much, Ken, for your presentation tonight. And um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And I will just say in closing, May is Mental Health Awareness Month and horses are the number one livestock and quite possibly um, animal that provides mental health benefits to humans. But I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, be well and have a great evening. Thank you. We'll see you next month on June 8th for a talk on forage analysis. That one will sure be one that will be helpful. <laughs>